Okay, we are going to start into chapter 6. So chapter 6 is the part of the book that starts going into the systems, individual systems. So the first system that we're going to talk about in chapter 6 is the somatosensory system. One thing that uh, you will find, I hope, as we start to go through these systems is that there is quite a bit of overlap in the information. So we're going to talk about the somatosensory system now, which is the sensory information that we get from the skin and the musculoskeletal systems. Um, we're going to talk about that now, but we will also refer to the peripheral nervous system and things that go on in the cerebrum and other parts of the central nervous system um, as well in the spinal cord. And then later on, we will specifically talk about those systems. So the spinal system and the cerebrum and the peripheral nervous system. So um, each chapter, each system we talk about builds on the previous information. So chapters one through five that we just finished up with, um, those are sort of the introductory information. So all of that information that we learned applies to all of the other things that we will study. So um, it's a very, we're building a house here and we've put down the foundation. And so um, now we're gonna start adding on the rest of the house. So um, talking, uh, starting in about the somatosensory system. So like I said, it's the sensory information that we get from the skin and the musculoskeletal system. So the information from the skin is our superficial or cutaneous information. So touch, pain, temperature. Um, right now it feels sort of cool in my office. And um, so I'm getting that information from my skin, that temperature information. Um, it also is the information from the musculoskeletal system um, about proprioception, where we are in space, pain, um, you know, pain from your joints or pain from your sitting on a tack or something like that. So um, all that information from the outside world is coming in through our somatosensory system. So that information has to be processed, has to be, um, has to travel through um, our system to our brain in order to be perceived. So our sensory information, our um, somatosensory system, those are sensors to the outside world. So we have temperature sensors that talk about heat and cold. We have pressure sensors that talk about, you know, what's touching us. We have light touch sensors. We have, um, deep, you know, deep pressure sensors. We have what we will often call pain sensors or pain receptors, but really kind of what they are is um, danger receptors. They are sending signals to our brain telling us something's wrong. There is potential for um, tissue damage here and you have to do something about it to get us out of that situation. So we have all of these receptors that are sending the information, but the distinction between sensory information, which are the nerve impulses that are generated from the stimuli, and sensation, which is our awareness of that stimulus or stimuli. Um, so sensory, the first step in the sensory process happens at the periphery, happens at the cutaneous or musculoskeletal level. Our awareness of that sensation happens in the central nervous system in the cerebrum. So that's a big distinction because we'll talk more later about pain and specific perception of pain. So we have those danger receptors or those damage receptors in our body, um, but it's the pain sensations are in our brain, okay? So of course, the speed of the information processing depends on the diameter of the axons. Like we talked about before, the larger axons are faster how much myelination, the more myelinated they are, the faster they are, and the number of synapses in the pathway. So it's not one nerve that goes straight from our body to our brain. There are different uh, way stations along the way, different synapses along the way. So we'll talk a little bit about that. So the first step in the sensory experience or the sensation experience 
um, are the sensory receptors. So sensory receptors are specialized nerve endings that respond only to a specific type of stimulus. Um, it has to be adequate stimulus and under normal conditions, meaning um, if it's one degree cooler in the house, I might not notice. Um, if it's five degrees cooler in the house, I'm probably going to notice that. So that's um, an adequate stimulus in order for me to notice the difference. Okay. So um, we'll talk about the different types of receptors. Uh, mechanoreceptors are, they respond to mechanical deformation of the receptor by touch, pressure, stretch, or vibration. So you'll remember back in 105 last summer, we were um, doing some sensory testing. These are the receptors that were receiving that information that was telling our brain what was going on with this sensory testing. So touch, pressure, stretch, vibration are the mechanoreceptors, and that makes sense. It's a mechanical thing that's happening. We're receiving that information, and it's going to our brain. Um, chemoreceptors, they are receptors for substances that are released by cells, including damaged cells after injury or infection. So it could be um, carbon dioxide that's released from the cells as a product, a byproduct of cellular metabolism. Um, we have chemoreceptors that um, sense the amount of carbon dioxide in our system and tell us, send the message to the medulla to tell us to breathe, to get oxygen in there and exchange some of that carbon dioxide. Um, it's also the histamines and other substances that damaged cells send out in order to call macrophages to the area and start um, cleaning up the damage, basically. So chemoreceptors are very important. Um, we will talk, when we talk about the autonomic nervous system, we'll talk about specific mechanoreceptors and chemoreceptors, like the one I just talked about that senses CO2, mechanoreceptors that um, sense pressure, like your blood pressure. So um, they're all the same type of sensory receptors. They're just working in a different system in the body. Thermoreceptors make sense. They are little thermometers. They transmit information regarding heat or cold. Okay, there is a special, so there are four types of sensory receptors that we're going to be talking about. Mechanoreceptors, chemoreceptors, thermoreceptors, and the fourth are called nociceptors. So nociceptors, those are our danger receptors. They are stimulated, they, and their stimulation results in the sensation of pain. Of course, the pain is in the brain, but those um, nociceptors are the things that tell you, hey, something's happening that might damage our tissues. We have to do something about it. So the example given here, the pressure that um, mechanoreceptors are stimulated by stubbing your toe. The sensation experienced is pain rather than pressure. Because, um, yeah, it hurts like heck when you stub your toe. <laughs> so the mechanoreceptors are um, stimulated, but because there's potential for tissue damage, the nociceptors are sending the, the message up to the brain. Okay, so... I'm going to switch over to the module, and we're just going to go through a little bit more about the sensory receptors. Um, so the sensory receptors, all those ones we talked about, they're located at the distal ends of peripheral nerves. So they encode sensory stimulation into receptor potentials, which are then sent up to the central nervous system. Um, the peripheral axons, peripheral um, sensory axons, are the afferents and they are classified by axon size. I don't know who came up with these, um, the lettering system for um, axons, but it's crazy. <laughs> so we have the, the there, this little chart shows the speed of axons, and the fastest one is that 1A axon. So it's fast, so we know it's large diameter, and it's and it's myelinated. It's a fast one. Um, so those are mechanoreceptors. Those are the one A's are the muscle spindles which stimulate muscle stretch or um, their stimulus is muscle stretch. So we will talk a little more in detail about these but this is just a, a speed comparison. 
Um, the next fastest ones are the 1B. Those are the Golgi tendon organs and the ligament receptors, and they sense um, tendon tension and ligament tension. And all three of those things, the muscle spindle, the um, Golgi tendon organs, and the ligament receptors, are sensing um, proprioceptive information. So naturally, that needs to happen quickly because the proprioceptive information goes to our cerebellum. The cerebellum says, oh, we need to adjust something, and it goes back, to, back through the efferent system to adjust something, to keep our balance and um, detect our position in space. So those are, that's a fast process. It's unconscious. We're doing it without even knowing about it. Okay, the, um, there, there are also type 2 or A beta um, neurons in the muscle spindles, which um, simulates, uh, are uh, stimulated by muscle stretch. Um, there are some joint capsules, some receptors in the joint capsules that are stimulated by joint movement, and those are also the type 2s or the A betas. Um, there are four different types of sensory endings that um, sense pressure and skin stretch and touch and vibration, and we will talk about those more specifically, and th th they're A betas. So they're pretty fast, not as fast as the um, 1As and 1Bs, but the A betas. Um, and then the slower ones are the A deltas and the C fibers. The A deltas and C fibers are both free nerve endings, and they sense tissue damage and temperature and coarse touch. Um, and also the sensation of itch and tickle, those aren't necessarily good sensations. So you can think of the A betas and the Cs, they're the slower neurons, and they're doing the temperature and pain and tickle and itch type things. And the C's are the nociceptors that are sensing tissue damage. Okay, and we will, I don't expect you to get that all right at first. I'm just going through them, and we're going to go through them over and over again. Okay, so from largest to smallest in diameter, the 1As, the 1Bs, the 2s, the A betas, the A deltas, and the Cs. So the 1As are the largest, and the Cs are the smallest. So the diameter of the axon is functionally important, and we talked about this before. Larger diameter axons transmit information faster than smaller diameter axons. Larger diameter axons are more myelinated, allowing for saltatory conduction, and that makes it faster. Okay? So there's a little video about peripheral sensory neurons that you may watch at your discretion. It's only 51 seconds, so um, 51 seconds of your life right there. Okay, so um, I'm going to talk a little bit more about the sensory receptors, which I kind of went over quickly before. They encode a stimulus into receptor potentials. So, so these four different kinds, I want you to know these, and I want you to know what their stimulus is. So uh, mechanoreceptors, their stimulus is the mechanical deformation of a receptor. So touch, pressure, stretch, or vibration. Okay, so you can imagine those are in your skin and in your arteries, and touch, pressure, stretch, or vibration is the stimulus that um, causes those mechanoreceptors to send off a receptor potential. Okay, chemoreceptors are the second kind, and they respond to substances released by cells, including response to damaged cells following injury or infection. Okay. Uh, the third type is the thermoreceptors, and they respond to heating or cooling. Doesn't that make sense? There are thermometers. There are sensory thermometers, okay? Uh, nociceptors, they're the subset that are sensitive to any stimulus that damages or threatens to damage tissue. So we have thermoreceptors that sense heat or cold. Nociceptors also sense heat or cold, but it's heat that might damage your tissue. So if you um, accidentally, you're um, a little, this happened to me when I was a kid, um, you're a little kid and you're going to climb up on the counter, um, it's likely that I was climbing up to uh, get to the cookie jar, knowing myself as a child. I put my little hand right on the stove 
which was still hot because it was an electric stove and it retained some of that heat even though it wasn't still on. Put my little hand right on that um, electrical burner. Okay, is that temperature threatening to damage tissue? Heck yeah it is. The only thing that saved me from a bad burn is I happened to have come in from the outside and I was wearing mittens. The mittens sustained most of the damage and luckily my hand didn't. So anything, so it's that temperature, it um, is a stimulus that's going to damage or threaten to damage tissue and it results in a, spains, a pain stimulus. Um, the information might reach your awareness in other words, you're like, yeah, when you pull your hand off the stove. Um, but it is also used to make automatic adjustments, um, subconscious or unconscious adjustments like your reflexes. So we have those spinal reflexes that automatically respond without us even having to be consciously aware of it. Okay. So um, those are the four types of sensory rece receptors, and you should know those and know the stimulus that um, the, the each one responds to. Okay, so we're going to talk about the receptive field of an afferent neuron. So the receptive field is the area of skin innervated by a single neuron. Okay, so receptive fields tend to be smaller distally in our bodies and larger proximally. So distal regions have a greater density of receptors than proximal. So the little diagram here, remember in 105 when we were doing sensory testing we did the two-point discrimination. So this little diagram shows the the yellow circle is the area on this, the receptive field of one sensory neuron. The blue circle is the receptive field of another sensory neuron. So um, the caliper and A, both points are in the same neuron's receptive field. So the, that is going to be perceived as one point because you're just stimulating that one neuron. Caliper B, one leg is in the sensory uh, receptive field for neuron A, or for the blue neuron. One leg is in the uh, receptive field for the yellow neuron, and that one is going to be perceived as two points. So, in the, um, in the more distal regions, we have smaller receptive fields, so it's more likely that we're going to perceive two points that are closer together because it's more likely that those two points are going to be on two separate sensory receptive fields. So, um, just a little explanation of what we've done, s you know, previously in classes. So, the, um, let's see, we're going to talk about the cutaneous innervation. So, the receptive fields are smaller distally and larger proximally. So, on your fingertip, we have really small fields, um, really small receptive fields, and if we did that two-point discrimination on our fingertip, they would pro you could probably get those two points really close together and still perceive them as two points. The same on your trunk, you're going to have a larger receptive field. It's likely with two points they're going to be in the same um, sensory receptive field for the same neuron and you're only going to distinguish it as one point. So a lot of those, we'll be talking about um, some of those tests that we did in 105, some of the sensory testing, and um, now what is the neurological basis for how that works. So it all connects up, doesn't it? So, um, when we're talking about cutaneous innervation or the innervation of the skin, um, a lot of that, the sensory information we're getting is touch. So, um, touch is categorized as fine touch or coarse touch. And so, fine touch uses a lot of different receptors and we'll talk about the different receptors um, so there are lots of different sensations that go into fine touch. Um, and coarse touch is um, mediated by free endings, free nerve endings throughout the skin. So um, the cutaneous receptors, they respond to touch, they respond to pressure, vibration, stretch, temperature, and our favorite, the noxious stimuli. 
So um, all of those different things. So when we were doing the testing in 105, um, we tested a lot of those things. We used the tuning forks to test for vibration. Um, we used the little test tubes to test for temperature. Um, the different uh, probes and things to test for um, touch and pressure. You know, the cotton ball versus the fingertip and that sort of thing. We didn't test noxious stimuli because that's just not nice to do to your classmates, is it? Okay, so each area, um, there's this diagram in the book and it really doesn't show up very well on this um, presentation, but it's on page 103 in the book. It's figure 6.4 and it's showing the um, cutaneous innervation of the peripheral nerves um, and the posterior uh, medial upper limb. So the, um, cutane the medial cutaneous nerve and the... Um, ulnar nerve and it just shows the different areas of the skin that are um, innervated by those different nerves. I don't necessarily need you to know anything specific about those. It's just a diagram of how the different information is going to travel in those nerve roots. But all of those are ending up on um, the C8 dorsal root. All of that information is going to the same place. And then later on when it gets to the cerebrum um, it's localized by where it is, and we'll talk a little bit about that. So, there are two different kind of, two different types of receptors. There are, you know, we talked about the four different kinds of sensory receptors, but um, there are two different categories of receptors, tonic and phasic. So a tonic receptor is a receptor that responds as long as the stimulus is maintained. So stretch receptors are an example of a tonic receptor. As long as you, s you still have stimulus, it's going to continue to respond. Um, phasic receptors adapt to a stimulus and stop responding, like with habituation. Um, so the example given is the brief response of cutaneous pressure receptors after putting on a watch. Um, after a while, they stop responding and you don't feel that you have your watch on. Um, otherwise, it would probably bug you all day. It's the same thing with your clothes. You put your clothes on and right at first you feel like, oh, these, uh, these pants are nice and soft or, um, oh, there's a tag that's itching me or <laughs> something like that. And... Um, after a while, you get used to it, though, and those phasic receptors stop responding. You habituated to that uh, stimulus. Okay, so there's a little video that's 13 minutes long about sensory receptors. It uh, goes over all the stuff that we've already talked about, so you can decide if you want to spend your 13 minutes um, reviewing that video. Okay, so this is a little chart on the cutaneous receptors which talks about the different somatosensory neurons and um, I like charts you guys probably already know that about me <laughs> I think charts are a great way to organize information so this is similar to um, the chart in chapter 6 that's on page let me tell you what page it's on I'm thinking 108, yep, 108, um, but I just, this is the way I organized it, um, and the, on 108 it's the same information, just organized in a slightly different fashion. So um, we talked about fine touch, coarse touch, nociceptors, which are, that's that noxious stimulus, and temperature. So fine touch, those are those A beta axons superficial fine touch. They have a small receptive field, so they're highly discriminatory. You can tell if you're touching one little area or the tiny little area right next to it. So the examples of these fine touch cutaneous receptors are, and we'll talk more about these specific types, but the Meissner's corpuscles, those ones are, um, their stimulus is light touch and vibration, and Merkel's disc and their stimulus is pressure. And there's a little um, diagram on the cutaneous receptors, which is right here. And it's so it shows the skin and the subcutaneous area, and that's where all these little nerve receptors live. So um, these little Merkel's discs, 
you can see they're right up on top, right underneath the skin. So they're t sensing that little pressure. Um, that they're flat little things and they're sensing pressure on your skin, like putting your watch on. The Meissner's corpuscles are, f are fairly superficial, close to the top of the skin, and there are a lot of them. You can see there are a lot. They have a small discrimina uh, discriminatory field, small receptive field. They're highly discriminatory, and they are sensing that light touch and vibration. So um, there are also subcutaneous fine touch receptors that have large receptive fields and are a little less discriminatory. There are ones that are called Piscinian corpuscles. I know, like where do they come up with these names? And you see that one is deeper and that um, Piscinian corpuscle is deeper in the subcutaneous tissue and it senses touch and vibration as well, but it has a larger receptive field and so it's not as discriminatory as the Meissner's corpuscle. Okay, and then the other ones are the Ruffini endings. Um, they are sensitive to the stretch of your skin. So you see they're sort of like these little crumpled guys, and as your skin stretches, that stimulates that nerve ending. Same thing, they have a, a larger receptive field, and they're less discriminatory. Because with skin stretch, you don't necessarily have to localize exactly where it is, but with touch and vibration, you probably do want to localize exactly where it is. So um, those guys are all A beta fibers. So the Merkel's disc, the Piscinian corpuscle, the Meissner's corpuscle, those are all, and the Ruffini endings, those are all A beta fibers. Okay, so when we're doing electrical stim for, um, we're doing IFC for pain control, we are stimulating those guys. We want those fine, um, those A betas, the superficial fine touch and the subcutaneous fine touch. We want to stimulate those to um, activate the gating mechanism in the spinal cord, and we'll talk more about that in Chapter 7. Um, so that is what we're doing with those sensory level e-stim treatments, okay? So then when we go into coarse touch and um, nociception and temperature, um, those are all free nerve endings. And when they say free nerve endings, it means they don't have a specific receptor type, like the Piscinian corpuscle or the Merkel's disc. They are, that's a nerve that has just free endings in the skin. And those are all A delta or and or C fibers. So we know the C fibers are the smallest and the least myelinated and the slowest and the A delta are a little bit faster, but they're still slower than the A betas, okay? So coarse touch, it's crudely localized touch and pressure. Tickle or itch, Ew. So C fibers are usually irritating things. Think of tickle or itch as an irritating thing. Um, nociceptors, they are sensors for pain and tissue damage. So um, really pain is in the brain and they're sensing potential tissue damage. Um, so those nociceptors are trying to warn us that something bad might happen. Okay, the temperature receptors, they are sensing h hot or cold that doesn't cause tissue damage. So um, I just came in from outside, my hands are cold. I touch my other arm with my hand and I'm like, ooh, that feels cold. Those are my temperature receptors, but not nociceptors because it's not a painful cold. It's just, I'm sensing, yes, that is cold. Okay, so I want you to know those different receptors and what their stimulus is. Okay, so a dermatome is an area of skin that is innervated by axons from cell bodies in a single dorsal root. So when you look at the um, dermatome chart on page 104 and 105, and we talked about this in, one o in uh, PTA 105 when we were um, talking about sensory testing. Um, so when you look at those dermatome charts, and it's the side with all the pretty colors, um, it shows each nerve root level and which cutaneous area is 
innervated by the axons from that single dorsal root on that nerve root level. Okay, um, the muscle spindle is a nerve ending that is in the muscle, embedded in the muscle, and it responds to muscle stretch and the rate of the of li muscle length change. So, in other words, if you change the um, length of the muscle really fast. Um, that is going to res that's going to respond more. The muscle spindle is going to respond more because if you're changing it really fast, there's the potential for tissue damage. Um, if you change it more slowly, the muscle spindle is not going to respond as quickly. So the muscle changes length, and the spindle sends messages to the spinal cord about the muscle length and the rate of change. Okay, um, w those are the afferent messages. Efferent messages are sent back to the muscle to control the muscle length change by contracting the end of the fibers. Okay, and we'll talk a little bit more about intrafusal fibers and extrafusal fibers in the in chapter 10 when we're talking about the motor system. There's a lot about that in chapter 6 and we're not going to go into it in this chapter. Um, we'll get into it a little more then. Um, but we're not going to talk about it right now. We just want to know that the muscle spindle is a is another um, somatosensory nerve ending that and its stimulus is muscle stretch and rate of change of the length of the muscle. Okay, the Golgi tendon organ is a nerve ending that is in the tendon. So it responds to slight changes in the tension of the tendon and it responds to tension from active muscle contraction and passive stretch. So the difference between the two, the muscle spindle responds to stretch and the Golgi tendon organ responds to muscle contraction and stretch. So it responds to both. So these are all going to be contributing to our proprioception, telling where our bodies are in space. The joint receptors are actually in the joint capsule and the ligaments and they respond to mechanical deformation of the joint capsule and ligaments. Okay, so in our joint receptors we have Ruffini endings, Pacinian corpuscles, ligament receptors and free nerve endings. So the Ruffini corpuscles or the Ruffini endings they respond to extremes of joint range. So when you bend your knee as far as you can bend it, that sensation that you get like yes that's the end of my range, those are from the Ruffini endings. The Pacinian corpuscles respond to movement. So when we move our joints, our body can tell where we are in space. Um, the ligament receptors are very similar to Golgi tendon organs, except instead of being in tendons, they're in ligaments, so they respond to tension just like the GTOs do. And the free nerve endings can be stimulated by inflammation. So a lot of times when you have joint pain, it's your free nerve endings that are sending that information. Okay? So Proprioception results from a combination of those cutaneous receptors, Golgi tendon organs, muscle spindles, and joint receptors. So people with total joint replacements, that now they have a titanium knee or a titanium hip, they still retain good joint proprioception um, because they still have um, the same ligament and tendon connections, they still have um, a lot of the same joint endings, even though they don't have um, all of the joint receptors, they still have um, a lot of the information that's coming in, so they can still have good proprioception and good balance. And that's one thing we work on a lot with people um, post-joint replacement, is we work on their balance, and we work on sort of reestablishing the brain's connection to that area so they can have that good proprioception and good balance. So this is the little dermatome chart, which I think you guys are all familiar with. Um, it has the peripheral nerves on the inside and the dermatomes on the outside. Um, I won't necessarily specifically ask you about individual dermatomes, although we will talk a little bit more about it in the peripheral nerve chapter. Um, but I just want you to know that the dermatome 
is the area of skin innervated by axons from s cell bodies in a single dorsal root. Okay, And it's specified by the nerve root level. So there are some, there's a video that talks about dermatomes, about, that's about five minutes, and then there's the dermatome dance, which was recorded by some students, and it's kind of funny. Um, and it's also a nice way to remember the dermatomes, if you want to do that. Um, there are some diagrams from the book of the uh, muscle spindles and the joint capsule endings, and um, it shows the ligament receptors and the um, type of nerve endings that are in those joints. Um, there's a little five-minute video on muscle spindles and Golgi tendon organs, which has some good information in it as well. So um, we are going to wrap up this part and in the next section we're going to talk about the second step, step in the sensation experience um, which happens at the spinal cord level.